Okay, everyone. Uh, thanks for turning up. Uh, let, uh, let's kick off now. And before I introduce uh, our speaker uh, today, just to remind you, this is part of a, a Friday nature seminar series that we kicked off this term for the first time, uh, but we will be continuing uh, throughout, throughout the year. And, uh, uh, and so if any of you have ideas of who you really want to see here uh, speak on any theme around nature, nature recovery, uh, feel free to approach me with, with your ideas. But just to flag up who we've got for the next few weeks, uh, next week we've got Ellen Belty from the Smithsonian looking at uh, changes in the, in the Great Plains of North America as indicated by in insects. Uh, and then the week after, on, fr on Friday the 2nd of December, we've got Guy Shrubsole talking about the lost rainforests of Britain. Uh, based on uh, uh, his new book on, on that topic, and that'll be a chance to also buy and have signed copies of that book if any of you uh, would like that. And the week after, we've got uh, Eric Lundgren from Aarhus in Denmark on introduced megafauna and the biological reality of nativeness. So, looking at the question of introduced animals and nativeness. Uh, we also have an extra one that isn't on this list on the 28th of November, Monday at 5 pm. We have Lena Chan from Singapore. National Park Service talking about Singapore as a city in nature and showing some of the pioneering work that Singapore has been doing about bringing nature in, into urban uh, city land landscapes as well. Uh, so moving on to today's speaker, we also have an online audience uh, as well as uh, in person. So Kathy uh, Willis has, uh, I've known her for, for, for quite, quite a while now. She, she was, a, 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 when I first knew her, she was a lecturer and professor here in geography. And then we lost her to zoology, where she was professor of biodiversity. And in both cases, had a particular interest in long-term ecology and using paleoecology as a tool to understand uh, contemporary uh, environmental change. But uh, a second uh, 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 research interest uh, was around, which developed, a, uh, was around the flow and extent of critical ecosystem services that we obtained from plant biodiversity, such as drawdown of CO2 and flood risk protection, uh, soil erosion, and other factors. After that, that time, she moved on to be Director of Science at the Royal Botanic Gardens in, in Kew, and also at that time was a member of the UK government's Natural Capital Committee. And since then, she's uh, come back to Oxford. She's Principal of St. Andrews Hall College uh, in Oxford, and uh, uh, also still continuing her research uh, in, in the biology department. And is also, as of this year, a crossbench peer in the House of Lords. I, I have, I'm always amazed at how much we managed to do <laughs> at the same time uh, uh, that, uh, as well. So it's a, uh, and, uh, and then actually what Cathy's talking about today is an even a newer dimension of her interests, uh, showing her constant expanding interest, which is about this interaction between nature and human health. And that's what we'll hear about today. So thank you, Cathy. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much. Right, so let me take stand back so everyone can see me. Well, thank you very much. It's very nice to see everyone here. It's a long time since I lectured in the Geography Lecture Theatre, so it's, it's very good to be back. So as you've been said, this is an area of research that I've become more and more interested in in the last five or so years, I suppose. And the reason for that, oh, if this will move on, hang on. Even this isn't working. Mm -hmm. Oh, hang on. No, they're not working. I'm afraid. <laughs> we try really hard. We try really hard. Okay, maybe maybe that we have to just move the move on that that way. Okay, all right. Yeah, that okay. right. yeah that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so the reason I got really um, interested in this was part of, the, as Yuvinda said, I was part of the government's natural capital committee for five years, and at that 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 committee and the work that I did on there, it was very much about understanding the natural capital assets, which are up here, so your species, your communities, landscapes, and how of extent, quantity, and spatial configuration, they provide critical ecosystem services. And of course, the one that everybody immediately thinks about is CO2 sequestration, but we've got things like soil erosion protection in here, um, water and air purification, land for recreation, and habitat to biodiversity. Now, those are the ecosystem services, but to be an ecosystem service, you know, to personify it, you have to have benefits. And so the benefits obtained are there at the end. I don't know how to move this on over. Okay, right. And 
The one I want to focus on are the benefits that we obtain from those ecosystem services for um, associated with health and particular physical and mental health. Now, the minute I talk about this, people all immediately say, oh, aspirin. Aspirin comes from plants and there's a direct link between drugs and, uh, and they talk about childhood leukemia, which is true. But it's we've moved a lot further on from looking at plants for their um, medicinal purposes to actually understanding plants on landscapes and whether or not they can have an impact on us physically and uh, physical and mental well-being. So there is an increasing awareness amongst our policymakers that green space is good for our health. I mean, this is a report that came out in 2016, but there are every year I see a couple of new reports where city councils, county councils, and um, not only in the UK, but globally, people starting to say, how can we build nature into cities in order to get the benefits from uh, the benefits that nature provides to physical and mental well-being? So, I just want to go through a number of well-known facts and some, then some less well-known facts about the role of vegetation and, and uh, nature in cities and you know, where people talk about it and where there's a whole new area of research emerging. The first one is that um, cities are really in, uh, trees in cities are really important for cleaning the air. So the, the, you've got the hairs on the leaves themselves, they act almost like a filtering mechanism to capture the particulate matter. But also less well known is the leaves themselves in that process of respiration, they take up things like um, sulfur, um, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide. And basically they break down those compounds in the leaves, which is so, they're so good at doing that. In fact, if you sweep up leaves from the street, then you don't actually want to use those as a fertilizer on your garden because you'll be killing a whole load of those chemicals on your soil. But that's a, that's, a, that's a classic one that people mention. Let's move on from this. The next one, well-known fact, is that vegetation in cities and it's well known that it can reduce your heat stress. So the, the red lines in there are without trees, the green lines are those parts of the cities with trees. That's over 12 hours each of those in different cities. You've got Boston, Washington, mm. Philadelphia, and Atlantic. All very straightforward. I don't think anyone would dispute those facts. The third one, and one that we're always told, although I'd say the evidence base for this is not quite as conclusive, is that if you've got more green space, you have less obesity because there's more space for people to exercise. And this was a this was a systematic review. This one where it showed that eighty nine percent of the studies where they looked at less case of beaches in cities when they had more small green space for physical activity. But now I'm going to move on to the less well known facts. So this is a study that was carried out in Toronto, and Toronto has many things to uh, recommend it. But I think one of the best things about Toronto is every single tree in the city is mapped. So they know the location of every single of every single tree on every single street. So if you look at this lower, this lower, I don't touch this thing, this lower thing up here, you'll see all those trees being mapped in here. Also, along with that, they also have a biobank in Toronto, which means that they have the health records of around 31, around 31,000 people. So they're able, and those people are geolocated. So they're able to link the health records of those people to the tree records in Toronto. And what they found when they looked at the two, the association, people who live in streets that have higher densities of trees um, have much better self-rated health perception, but also significantly less cardiometabolic conditions, heart conditions, and things associated with stress. So that's one thing I've always found, and the number of studies have been done on other, other cities that have come out with this, but it is an association, it's looking at the number of trees and then looking at health records. But I think this is a particularly nice study, which showed that as your trees died, your health got worse in the city. So this study in here, this study was carried out, it was looking at the emerald ash borer, which is this little metallic beetle you can see on the, on the top here. And this thing basically bores its way through the trees. It creates these little, um, these little burrows throughout the trees. And eventually the trees can stop the, effectively uh, uh, it damages the whole flow of um, uh, carbohydrates and other things around the tree. And as a result of that, the tree dies in three to four years. Now, 
in America, the emerald ash borer has killed 100 million ash trees in this period between two, uh, 1990 and 2007. But the other thing you can see there, the red is when they were, the, the trees were infested in 2002, the blue is 2007, and the green is 2010. So effectively, you've got a wave of infestation going across these different counties in the United States. And what they showed on this, this is just an example, this is what a tree, a street looks like before and after it's been visited by your emerald ash borer. So pretty depressing, you've completely lost all your leaves from the, all those trees are dead. But as the counties got infected with the emerald ash borer, you've got a significant increase in human related deaths associated with cardiovascular and respiratory tract illnesses. So there seems to be a very close association between the two. And they estimated at the end of this that it was around over 6,000 deaths related to these and 15,000 cardiovascular related deaths, all linked back through. So I'll go back to one, all linked back through. Can I go back? To this movement or associated with the emerald ash borer. Now you can see, well, that's, there could be many other things going on. It could be related to the amount of pollution removed and then you lost all of those things. But I think this to me then starts to move this whole discussion on when you look at this, this paper here. So this was published in one of our top medical journals, Lancet Planet Health. And it was actually done by um, two people in Hong Kong, uh, Chimney Saka and Chris Webster and John Gallagher, who's up, in his professor in psychiatry up the hill in the um, in the Warmford. And what they did was they looked at the, they looked at the UK and they looked at 26 cities in the UK and they used the UK Biobank. And um, at a 30 meter resolution, they compared um, mental health outcomes with how green each pixel was where the person lived and greenness as recorded through NDVI, which is a measure of photosynthetic health in there. And what they found in this was that those people who live in greener areas have better mental health outcomes. However, it's not the amount of space, but it's the color of green. So very, very different, just thinking more green space, better mental health outcomes. And it, it, Every time you've got with an incremental increase in green, you have a, seems to have a greater protective effect on depressive disorders. And the effects were more pronounced amongst women and people less than six years in age and of lower economic status, but the results were still strongly statistically significant. And even more interesting, I think the same studies have been carried out in a number of other countries in the world, in the US, in Catalonia, France, and South. South Africa, and all of them have shown the same relationship. So the NDVI greenness, and the greener it gets, the lower the, um, each incremental increase in green, the lower the depressive disorders that you're seeing in the me medical records. So I just sort of throw Oxford in here so you can all spot where you live, and work out actually how high you are on the, but that's just a, that's just a, 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 a by the by. Okay, so, I think there's a number of really important questions that arise from this because of this, there seems to be a direct link between these things that we're seeing or association between these different aspects of nature and positive health outcomes. But the first one is which aspects of nature are responsible? The first thing we're looking at with the number of trees, that first study, this one's looking at the amount of biomass. Maybe there are other things in there. But it's not only that association, what you need to understand or what we, we absolutely need to find out then is what are the physiological and psychological mechanisms responsible for these positive health outcomes that we're seeing? And then I think even more importantly, how should we then be planning our nature and valuing our nature for the health benefits that it can provide? And I love this quote. Um, and it's written by somebody a couple of years ago who wrote a uh, systematic evidence-based review on all this data. And she said, if nature is the medicine, then what are its active ingredients? And I think it's that, it's that framing that we now need to look at, not just saying, we'll make more green space, people will be better. It's understanding 
what parts of that green space, what, what is it in the green space that we need in order to get maximum health benefits? So there are four hypotheses currently out there about what, what is going on, why we're seeing these associations, this direct interaction between nature and health. The first one is, is to do with the overall diversity of the vegetation and biomass. So that would link back through to the NDVI result. The second one though, is there's nothing to do with that. It's actually the color of the vegetation itself. Different colors have different impacts on us physiologically and psychologically. And that in the long run results in a, in a health outcome. The third one, which is probably one you most be know least of all about is it's actually the shape of the vegetation. And I'll explain why, but in particular, the fractal dimensions of the vegetation on the landscape that can affect us. And finally, it's actually nothing to do with any of those or less to do with them. And it's something to do with the, the scent, the organic volatile compounds that we get from plants. So I'm now going to look at the evidence base that we have for these four hypotheses and then come on at the end to how we value and if we can value nature. But I just want to make the point, this is a really new, newly emerging uh, research field. And many of the papers and studies in here are not traditional geography or biology. You're finding them in places like Lancet, you're finding them in... And then you find, you find a lot of work going on, for example, in urban planning and in architecture. So it's a very, very broad research field, which is why I think it's one of these ones that links very closely to the sort of Leader Hume Centre as well and the work that Yavinda and his team are doing. Okay, so the overall diversity of vegetation amount of biomass. Now, a lot of this work originally started off with um, Shirin Yoko, which is the Japanese uh, art of forest bathing. And there's a lot of work that's been done about people going and sitting in the forest and finding that two hours in the forest can have as, uh, be as beneficial as taking antidepressants. Now, when I first looked at this, I thought this was a very, very old traditional um, uh, saying and a traditional uh, practice. The actual forest bathing terminology is a marketing terminology that came out, in, uh, I think it was in 1995, quite recently, in order to get more people in Japan to go and enjoy the forests. And they came up with this idea of forest bathing. Anyway, I still think it's, a, it's clearly now has ended up going a completely different way and suddenly being seen as a really important medical intervention um, in order to bring about uh, improved well-being. All right, let's move on. So this is one of the first experiments. So a lot of these experiments then, you can have your associations, your big data sets, but you then need to move them into a clinical setting in order to keep everything else controlled to start to tease apart what different things might be bringing about these changes. So this is one of the first and one of the most simple ones, I'd say, it's carried out in 2018. And what the, what, there are various ways you can measure stress. You can measure it through um, uh, how it changes your uh, endocrine um, and through the hormonal change your body, but you can also, there's a, sort of your auto, um, your, basically when you look at heart rate variability and it's the, it's the nervous system you look at various things in the nervous system and how they change and then the third one is looking at questionnaires to look about at, at, think about how you um, respond psychologically to different uh, to different um, visual cues so this one in particular it was looking at the nervous system here so it looked at heart rate variability it looked at brain activity and um, neuron um, firing in certain parts of the brain, and then a psychological measurement, which was questionnaires. And these students, they looked at that, you can see in here, they looked at a green screen with trees, and then they looked at a cityscape. Very, very simple, with a break between the two. So what did it show? So <clears throat> I'm gonna use this pointer, but I hope people on screen can see it, work it out anyway. So the ones at the bottom here, are your forest image. And the one at the top here is your city image and strongly statistically significant in here. And this is your psychological measurement. And what it shows in here is that within 90 seconds, you had a significant difference in your oxyhemoglobin um, concentration in the blood flow to the brain, which um, is a response associated with psychological calming. <clears throat> and also, there's significant difference in subjective feelings as measured by the questionnaires. The students 
felt very comfortable, very relaxed, and very natural when they looked at the forest image versus the city image. So you've got both psychological and physiological responses occurring in there. But what about when you go walking in a city? So when we when we do our, if you have 15 minutes at lunchtime, does it matter if you walk in the streets or should be should you be walking in the park? Will it have any any difference in the well-being you get from this? So this one they had uh Japanese these two walks. The first one they did 15 minutes around the city area, and the second time they did the same 15 minutes at the same pace, but around the park. And what did that show? So what they found was they wore, they wore heart monitors and the parasympathetic heart rate activity, which is enhanced in relaxing situations. That's the one in black, the black circles there, significantly higher when they walk around the park rather than walk around the streets. So definitely go for the parks at lunchtime. And the sympathetic heart rate activity, which is enhanced in stressful situations, showed the opposite, much lower. And then the last one here, when they looked at the overall heartbeat rate, it was much lower in the park, even though they're walking at the same pace and doing exactly the same amount of, um, exactly the same sort of circuit. So all three of those indicate that they were in a much more physiologically relaxed state when they walked in the green areas. So then the next question is, well, how much time do we need to spend then in order to get maximum benefits, these maximum physiological and psychological benefits. And I really like this study, for, and I'll explain why when or you'll understand when I get turned to it. So they had 36 participants at University of Mich Michigan, and they were allowed to, over an eight week period, they went into the, they were allowed to choose when they walked, but when they walked, um, they also took a number of measures each time. And they could either walk or they could run, or this is my favorite one, they could sit. And what they measured here, they looked, so they were looking at the endocrine system here. So they were looking at um, the, they were looking at um, cortisol, which is a stress hormone and digestive amylase um, in, the, in the saliva before and after their na each nature experience. What do they find? Right. So this one here, the first one, and that what this shows here, the, the one I've got marked in red, is a drop in cortisol, so a drop in the stress hormone. It was 18.5% when they walked between 21 to 30 minutes, and it went 8.3, 8 which was 7 to 14 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes, 3.7, 18.5. But when they walked for more than 30 minutes, you didn't get an increased benefit in stress. It was 11.4. So, in fact, 20 minutes is that sort of ideal time for, for, for walking and getting the benefits from being out in the green. But I, I particularly like this one because in fact, what they found was the cortisol change when you were sitting and walking rather than running or walking was the highest. Well, it was the same 21.3 or a drop by that, but a huge drop in the slivery amylase when you're sitting rather than doing these other activities. So it does suggest you don't have to be pounding the pavements or pounding the parkland in order to get these, these really important reductions in physiological and psychological stress. But I, that's told you a relationship and start to show a mechanism, but that doesn't answer the question that I asked at the beginning, is, which is what aspects of, the, of that green vegetation are actually causing this to happen? What's going on in here? Is it the shape, the color, or the smell, or possibly all three? So the first hypothesis, or hypothesis number two, is to do with the shape and the fractal dimension of trees and shrubs. So what do I mean by that? Well, actually, when you look at vegetation, what they show from the, um, eye, measure, uh, eye movement um, measurements is that our eyes are focusing on the outline. They're not looking, they're picking the outline of the image of the of the horizon or of the vegetation itself. And even more interesting than that, in fact, what our eyes are doing are picking out the fractal dimension that they can see in the thing in front of them. And so things that have fractal dimensions, our eyes are picking out 
that particular pattern in there. So if you look at when I talk about fractional dimensions, this is many of you probably know this, it's the number of times a recurring pattern is nested within, within a, a larger pattern. So if we look at the trees, we look at trees, you've got the, your large branches, you focus on down, there are still the same branching pattern, but smaller branches. You focus on down, still the same pattern, but it's actually with the twigs. So that would be a fractional dimension in there. And in order, what, we, what you need to do is capture that complexity. And they do that by a thing called the fractional dimension, which is a ratio between one and two, where one, a straight line has no fractional dimension. But as, you, as your line wobbles, it gets more and more, more and more greater fractional complexity. It moves closer towards two. Now, <clears throat> nature, many aspects of nature have a fractal dimension and woody plants and trees go between 1.28 and 1.9. So does that make any difference? Okay, let's look at this experiment. Let me just show you some outlines then of nature. So here you've got a coniferous forest in Canada. That outline has a fractal dimension of 1.5. Compare that to a savanna landscape, so a few trees on an open landscape, it has a fractal dimension of 1.3 or 1.31. Cityscape, 1.2. So you'll see when you start to look at horizons, you'll see that actually they have very, and when we're looking, we are looking at that, at that outline, that fractal dimension. So does this fractal dimension on landscape have any influential, um, any influence on our, our, our health outcomes? And this was, this was some really interesting work done, published in the Frontiers in Neurosciences, Human Neurosciences. So this person looks quite scary. It's not, they're wearing a, a cap, which is um, it's an EEG, where effectively you have electrodes that touch the edge of the brain. And it, it basically, it's, it's measuring the different, the brain, what the activity, the brainwave activity in your, in your head. And um, so it's, it's, it's the neurons that are sparking off and then you'll see what the, the brainwave activity is there. It's the frequency of them, the wavelength of the electric current. And so what they did was they showed participants four different fractal images, 1.14, 1.32, 1.51 and 1.70. And then what they measured was their brain. So before we do that, I'm going to show you four fractal pictures. So if you could look at those four pictures just for one minute. And then we're going to say, who likes, and let's start at the back, who likes D the most? Put your hand up if, you, if, if D is the one that makes you feel three. Who likes C? you're not going to work who likes b okay all right that's better <laughs> Happy with that. and who likes a okay most of you apart from one or two weird people like like b the best okay let me just give you those fractal dimensions okay 1.14 1.32 1.51 and 1.70 right why am i why am i saying this well in the experiments that I showed with the people wearing those skull caps, when they looked at the brainwave activity, is 1.32, the one you all put your hands up for. And what they showed was when you look at a fractional image of 1.32, all of these, there was a very, very strong result here. The, there was a, um, the alpha component was elevated. That alpha component in your brainwave activity is linked to being inc an increased wakefulness and a relaxed state. You'll see very clearly here, there's a reduced delta activity, which is prominent during drowsiness and sleep. And there's a heightened beta frequency, which means more external focus and attention. So there is a link between that fractal diameter and how it's affecting that brainwave activity and the links through to that. So let's just go back to those landscapes then and looking at different landscapes in here. And this time they looked, they got 200 participants about that and they chose 80 scenes of nature and asked people to select which scenes they most liked. And then they looked at the fractal dimensions of those scenes. So which landscapes should they be viewing at? And I gave you those two before. 
the vast majority of people chose this landscape, which is a savanna landscape with few trees on it, over this landscape, which is the coniferous forest. Coniferous forest fractional dimension of 1.5, the one that everyone chose has a fractional dimension of 1.3. So there seems to be a particular landscape that we look at, which is this open landscape. When we look at that out of a window or in a parkland, that is what then seems to bring about this relaxed mental state. Further works have now been done since this was published has also looked at cognitive ability. When you look at this sort of landscape, there's a link to having greater focus and attention in and improved cognitive tests as well. But it's clearly not only fractional state, because when they look, these, these, they did another study where they looked at yet more men walking around in, in a city. <laughs> what they found actually is that in both seasons, you, that they, were, they had this uh, suppressed sympathetic nerve activity, that's a reduction in stress. But in winter, there was no significant difference in, in, this, in, the, um, in the sympathetic nerve uh, activity detected. So springtime, they found it, winter, they didn't. So when the trees lost their leaves, even though you would have had even more fractal um, uh, complexity being shown, you didn't find um, a change happening there. Which leads on to the next hypothesis then, which is to do with the amount of color or the color in the plants. So as you probably all know, color in plants is linked to the pigments, the various things that make plants colored, leaves colored. But this, it's actually asking of those colors we see in leaves, are there some plants where the color actually has a better effect on us than others? And so this is another really nice ex experiment looking at the effects of color on our physiological and psychological well-being. And here they use ivy, heterohelix, because it's very plastic and, and it's, it's, uh, you can get red colors, green colors, white, white and green colors. So therefore you've got the same shape, the same size, keeping all those things constant, but different colors. And again, same thing here, they looked at the brain activity, and here they were looking at oxyhemoglobin um, at, um, it, levels in the brain. I won't go into what that all means. Uh, it's just another way of looking at what's happening in your brain when you view these different colors. And what they found here is that effectively green, white, and green, yellow was when you've got the greatest activity in the brain that was associated with um, increased relaxation. When they looked at the number of times your eye fixed on these, these leaves, i.e. you're looking at the, the, your preference for eye colour, they found again it was green, yellow and bright green. And lastly, the green and white plants were the ones that they preferred in subjective feelings. But I just want to point out here, note, no one liked the red plants. And the red plants also made people, um, they certainly, if you look at the one at the end, there was no relaxation with red plants. So poncettias at Christmas are a really bad idea. So don't go near those. Okay, but there's, so we've looked at leaves, but what about flowers? If you have a flower, if you have flowers on your desk, does it make any difference or is this just looks nice? So this is, I love this experiment. They just unscented flowers on a desk and they, they've marked out his eyes, not really wearing a, a, a blindfold in there. Okay, so here, 30 unscented with pink roses on the desk. They just measured in here, very simple, measured the, um, uh, the uh, what is it, the blood? Oh, it's, it's uh, it, uh, yes, it's, it's, an, it's just another measure of your blood pressure in there. And what they showed by just having those flowers on the desk versus no flowers, again, 21% increase in parasympathetic nervous activity, which it means you're much more relaxed having flowers on your desk. And again, they felt much more comfortable when your roses were there. So a simple stimulus of having roses on your desk and preferably white and green ones probably is uh, really good for your own uh, mental well-being. But what about plastic? Well, they do. So there's a really nice, you know, I often see in offices plastic or polyester, you know, these polyester flowers. I think this is a great experiment where they basically got students to look at, to look at, they did the same experiment measuring this heart rate variability. So you've got your uh, fresh ones on one side and you've got your artificial ones on the other. You can, when you look at them, you can barely tell. You do sometimes have to actually feel them to think, are they really a plant? Anyway, so the students weren't told 
that they were plant or um, they were plastic or, or real or polyester and real. And what they found in here is that real flowers, they got a significant reduction in stress, whereas um, the artificial flowers, you didn't. And the real flowers, they felt significantly more comfortable, whereas the artificial flowers, you didn't. So it can't just be to do with color because clearly they were not, they were exactly the same in color and they were the same in size and shape. Which leads me on then to the last hypothesis, which is that it's the green scent given off by species. So this probably, this really surprised me when I, so we only really understood the olfactory genes and the whole coding for olfactory genes. We only, so the person who did that work, the Nobel Prize was awarded in 2000. It's the most recent um, understand the most recent uh, sense that we've really got a proper understanding of. We can smell up to one trillion different smells. Well, you know, all this thing dogs can smell more. Don't believe it. It's actually, we have around 400 olfactory receptors in our noses. Now, plants produce, uh, produce from scent glands, they organic volatile compounds, Vox. And these, these evaporate very easily in room te temperature. Th therefore, you get these lovely smells. And these different carbon compounds join together. So you'll have some plants that smell exactly the same, even though they're completely other end of the plant phylogeny, because they have the same compounds making up those smells. So which ones are not been that many studies, but one of them is lime, uh, limoline, which you get in limes and citrus. And it's, a, it's one of the most common organic volatile compounds in nature. You find it not only in, in lemons in the kitchen, but also many trees and a lot of wood has this. So this is a very simple experiment where, um, so these are two, you've got the Japanese red sea, cedar and the Korean pine, they both have limonene in them. And here, students sitting there with a smell coming out into their face here. And what they found when you smell the limonene, you have it it's much more relaxed in in much more relaxed higher parasympathetic heartbeats are significantly lower and the subjects feel more comfortable really interesting but for me this is the most interesting experiment of all so this is what happened in this one is they had 12 healthy male subjects and they put them in a hotel they stayed in a hotel room for three nights and when they're in that room they diffused um, Japanese uh, hinoki oil from the Japanese cypress. Now I have some here on these fixed papers. So while I'm talking about it, you can smell what it's like. So please just hand those around. You've been gonna give me them. Just take one and pass them on. Because I think it's quite, when you're talking about smell, it's very flat otherwise. I love the smell, but you'll explain, you'll explain why when I get that. Okay, so three nights and they measured they measured their bloods and uh, urine and also their, their blood pressure. All right, let me keep going. Oh, what's it doing? Come on. <laughs> okay. So what they found after three days that their stress hormones were significantly lower from smelling this compound. So they had a big a reduction in the hormone adrenaline in, in the blood. Now, a thing I didn't say before, the thing with the organic volatile compounds is what happens with those, when you smell them and you don't smell them and then the smell goes straight out again, it passes across the membrane into your blood. And people who walk in a forest with a lot of pine in, for example, you measure their blood after they walk through the forest, you, can, you, you pick up the pine compounds in the blood. What they found though, and I think this is the most interesting one in here, is this, is this second thing in here. Very, very significant. By smelling these compounds, there's a big raise in natural killer cells in their blood. Natural killer cells are the cells that attack viruses and cancers. And therefore it is, it's enhancing your immune system function by smelling what I've just passed around the room. But it's not an instantaneous, I mean, so the other thing, there's this lovely paper published in Toxicology that showed even seven days after walking, 
in in these in these uh, in in forests that have this these woods in, you still have these elevated natural killer cells in your blood. So therefore, it's a long term thing that actually carries on. I have to say, I now have this in a diffuser in my bedroom at home. I'd recommend anyone doing that. But it, to me, it, it's moved it away from just being physiological relaxation and cycle, but also moving into, into a different way. Why is this happening? Well, what happens with this, and there's many other examples, I've got time to talk about them today. These, these volatile organic compounds pass into your bloodstream and they behave and they, in a biochemical way. They work in the same, on the same pathways as other drugs that you take for other di different things. So for example, when you put you know, lavender on your pillow at night and think, well, that's all very nice, but it's quite sort of tree huggy. It's not. Actually, lavender on your pillow at night, lav lavender has that effect. It, it basically works through that biochemical pathway and it acts as a relaxant in the sort of same way as if you take a drug to make you go to sleep. Rosemary is the opposite. It keeps you awake. And if you want to, if you're trying to revise for exams or anything else, I thoroughly recommend rosemary in a diffuser in your room. Um, so there are many plants that people are now working at. And actually the one I was really, mm. there was a lovely exa example of rosemary where they um, put, put it in the face masks of nurses at night. And they showed that it kept the nurses more alert in the hospital when they had, were smelling rosemary rather than just having water. So the very last part, and then I'll be quiet, is how then do we value this nature for its health benefits? And there are two ways you can value it. First one in terms of its efficacy. So how good is it in comparison to taking traditional drugs? And the second one, valuation in terms of, it, of its costs. And this is where people are starting to look at this, because if this, is, if this works out to be cheaper and more beneficial, then we should start to actively plan specific sorts of nature in cities, in our rooms, in our hospitals, in order to get these benefits and move away from just general nature to actually start to say, we should have more of these trees or more of these flowers in our, in our, in our rooms. So there's not many studies, and this is a very, very you know, new work, but this one is looking, and this is a lovely study done um, in Denmark, where the uh, University of Copenhagen, so they have a nature therapy garden, but they also, what they, they compared people doing three weekly sessions over 10 weeks in the nature therapy garden versus 21 hour sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy. And these were people doing this, these are people who were all registered as clinically stressed and unable to work. And so they had this experiment over 10 weeks and compared the outcomes. So the cognitive behavioral therapy is much, much more expensive as you can imagine than people spending time in the gardens. So what did they find? Well, the first thing is both of them worked, which is really good, very good news, that there were significantly higher general wellbeing scores and lower back for burnout scores at the end than at the beginning. And if you think about the value of this, both of them le then led to a lot less trips to see the GP or the physician, and therefore you have a, a cost benefit in there. But this to me is the most interesting result. When they looked 12 months on, so how effective is it in the long term, 77% of those who underwent the nature-based therapy were knocked on 60% six, six, who did the cognitive behavioural therapy. And so therefore, this preliminary result starts to suggest that actually the efficacy of this, of the nature-based therapy, it's got a higher level of efficacy than the CBT. So the other three, the, the, the second question, the very last thing I just want to address is, what about, are they good economic value? And this is a study published last year by two women from Essex, uh, at the University of Essex, um, uh, Pretty and Barton, and they compared four different uh, niche-based therapies, the so woodlands being the woodlands, horticulture, gardening, um, uh, tai Chi movement outside in the green uh, and then green care eco mines, which is a sort of uh, yeah. So the first one is the one we want to concentrate on. That's being out in the woodland. And what they have in here, they looked at the margin of change in terms of life happiness and these this scores they were using um, and uh, life satisfaction happiness scores. And the greatest change they found 
So when they spent time in the woodland than the other ones in here. And then what they then found finally, to get this thing to work, is that if you look at the costs and benefits, Again, what you find is that we've got the costs from preventing from reduced public services. You've got the costs from reduced loneliness and having to um, have care. The costs and benefits created from increased happiness and therefore more ability to go to work. And effectively what they found in here, oh dear, this thing's driving me mad, sorry. Is that, so sure enough, that actually the, by far the highest cost benefit came through from people who spent time out in the in the forest, in the Green Trust, around benefits after one year, 13 to 14,000 pounds worth of benefits. And finally, what they found is that the cost per person, that when they added all of these things up, they found that if you bring in this nature-based approach to medicine and to people's well-being, it's around 31,000 pounds a year. So once you start to put that sort of value in front of health economists, they do stop and start to listen because I think there's huge potential to, re to really start to look at how we can use some of these, these approaches rather than the traditional prescription. But I want to just give a final few thoughts here. So it was Hippocrates who said nature is the physician of diseases. And Non-communicable diseases, i.e. Uh, cancers, heart attacks, strokes, um, and, and mental illnesses, they kill 41 million people a year right now. And it's equivalent to 71% of deaths globally. So when we often think about deaths globally, we often don't realize quite how big a, a, a burden this, these sorts of illnesses are on the, on the health system. And there's increasing scientific evidence. Obviously, I hope I've demonstrated to you that, that nature can provide some very effective treatments in here. But we're still miles away from having a research framework. And we're still far too often just think, let's have a few more trees in the city or a few more green spaces. We need to start to view nature in the same way that we view other drugs. We need to understand the dose response relationship. We need to understand what ingredients we people should be embracing in order to get those benefits from nature. And my very final point is that that's a, that is a considerable knowledge gap, but other ones, we probably, I've totaled this up before, around a hundred vascular plant species, give or take a few, have really been studied in detail to date. We have 400,000 vascular plant species out there. We're just scraping the surface and there are many, many more that need to be looked at. The other thing you will have noticed from the, the, the photos, that the vast number of these studies have been carried out in um, Southeast Asia, US and Northern Europe. And a proper understanding of cultural differences is, is, is urgent. We need to understand actually, is this true of other societies as well? There's, there's a number of studies that suggest it is the case, but we need a much, much better framework to understand that. And finally, I've talked more about the benefits, but we also know there are some plants that are horribly poisonous. And so therefore we do need to have a palette. We need to know what that palette of species is that has the beneficial effects on human health and which ones we really do need to avoid. So that is it. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Very multi sensory experience. I've never, in a science talk, I've never had so much practical advice for what to do with my life. I appreciate it to avoid the context here. Thank you for that. So, we'll open up for questions. I'll pick up with one. Is it that link between volatiles yeah. and uh, killer cells? Yeah. Well, what's, the, what's the mechanism? Well, what, in terms of actually why does the immune system respond to volatiles? So, I'll open to any thoughts on that. If I think, well, no, I, I mean, I think what, what the, the work that I've seen, I mean, that's been published in toxicology and things, is, is it comes back to um, the biochemical pathways in the blood and how the, those volatile compounds in the blood uh, affect different, different pathways. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, I mean, there's still a, a lot of work being done on that. But I was, I mean, most of that work has been done by biochemists, actually. So again, it comes back to this is such a big research area. 
but it, 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 it's direct. It's, a, it's the direct influence of those, of those uh, chemicals in the blood and how they interact with other pathways. Right. And I think there's some sort of a equilibrary part of this. So, so I can see, say, with the savannah like landscape yeah. that we've all. The savannah is an interesting one. Yeah. So there's sort of, there is, there's a whole school of thought of the sort of out of Africa approach that, mm -hmm. um, you know, that it's the open trees and that's what we, we evolved and it's a deep evolutionary trait. There are other people that say, well, you know, that's all well and good, but why would that sort of landscape make you more relaxed? You know, and I think that's also a really good point. And they, you know, um, because it's it's not like um, the point that the, the, the person who made that comment in one paper said, it's not like that's going to tell you where the food is, which so on an evolutionary trait, you'd think it would be. So I think there's people tend to, they want to put that into their purpose. Yes. I, I think God, my choice is that's where you can see the predators and the forest. You have no idea. <laughs> well, the there's <laughs> another really good study actually. Was, um, I think we mentioned it yesterday, where if you if you're in a city and you look at the um you look at the sort of the, the trees on a on a, a street, what they showed was that up to about thirty percent trees in your hundred eighty degree vision, and you get more and more relaxed. Over that, the stress goes the other way. You get more stress. <laughs> and I think I, actually when I'm walking. When it's too dense a forest, I'm not happy. Um, you know, and I think it, that comes back to actually worrying about people or things, you know, lurking in the background. Um, and so it, there are these. It's, this comes back to what you need to do in planning. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Kathy, can I just ask you to stand around? Yes, sorry. All right. Mind you, okay. Okay. Uh, very simple. Very question. Um, on the subject of planning, uh, you mentioned this being an opportunity to start. Um, selecting specific plants and species for um you know urban planning mm. um given that as you said maybe 100 species have been examined out of 400 yeah, yeah um would it not be a bit premature to start being quite so selective if we yeah. don't really understand you know all about it what why not diversify I think we know enough already that Robinia probably isn't going to have any effect on Glossus at all. And then actually we're going to put trees in this in the, in the same way that we do select trees because of their pollutant. Um, you know, that's why we've got so much Platinus orientalis in London, because it's very, very good at taking the pollutant up from the air and it can strip off its uh, the bark is pollutant tolerant. So we know enough about some of these plants that we know that they have a beneficial effect. For example, some of the some of the cedars, some of the um, uh, pinaceae, the trees that are going to give out pinaceae. So I think we need to start to build those in. If we wait till we know all the knowledge, we'll never ever get to that point. To start. So I think right now we are, you know, we have, you know, I was just thinking about North Oxford, we've got ginkgos everywhere. Well, okay, they look nice. But I'd rather have a tree that I also knew was going to do more than that. Sure, but there, there is kind of, you know, a, a difference between making sure that some of a tree that has been demonstrated to have a beneficial yeah. effect is included and, you know, over medicalizing it almost, assuming that we know all of the effects. Yeah. yeah. And maybe reducing species diversity, but also reducing potentially. The impact. I don't think we'd reduce species diversity. Um, and I I mean, I think, well, I mean, a lot of the work is already done in some places. They already got in hospitals, for example, um, especially in the States now, they have um, gardens that they are putting these species from all of these experiments in those gardens because they know they have benefits. So I, don't, I just think that we just need to be a bit broader in the way that we think about. Right now, we think about most vegetation is street furniture. We don't think about it in terms of its health benefits. And all I'm saying is I think the time has come to move a little bit further on in that discussion about if we're going to plant new trees, can we also think about the health benefits associated with it? And, you know, not plant them too close together would be another one. It's, it's, so they're not, none of these are, but I, as I hope I made the point at the end, we're nowhere near at the point where we can start to prescribe nature, even though we have many nature prescriptions going on. Because we don't know enough, uh, particularly about the efficacy, would be I'd say. Yeah, just a question more of genuine ignorance. Um, is there any comparable work in relation to the health benefits of being proximate to water? Yes. 
I mean, I'm Australian and bi, I think. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, that's kind of yeah. you know, and, and if so, is there a stronger case to be made for that relative to yeah. being in the outback where it's hot and scary? Yeah, um, it depends. That I think, I mean, that landscape. So, when you're looking at landscapes, the horizon, fractal um, shape, the horizon is important, but also being able to see blue. And being able to see water bodies is another one, um, but that is only one aspect of the water. You don't, don't necessarily get the other additional benefits that are in there, the sensory benefits. I'll take one from online, from 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 Maya. Uh, if we prioritise planning over nature and human health benefits, do we risk compromising the health of other things you know, like biodiversity and urban, urban ecology? I, I can't see how we could. Uh, I mean, I. I mean, we're not saying, I, I would never suggest, and I think anyone is suggesting, you have a whole street where you only have one sort of tree. I mean, I, I, urban biodiversity is, um, uh, uh, the answer to that is no, I don't think so, actually. <laughs> Other than, um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm interested in this question of urban biodiversity, actually. I mean, plants and animals are finding their own ways within urban environments, regardless of what we do, thank goodness. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I don't think we'll be compromising urban biodiversity far from it. Okay. Um, thank you very much for that talk. Um, my question is about um, how you want to emphasise the benefits of walking through the park mm. or mm. spending time in the care garden. Mm. Um, to what extent does this experience, does this experience have to be a conscious experience of that, like, place? Yeah. Be walking through the park. Yeah. Be really stressed in your head and be like yeah. so tangled up in this issue. Could it be an unconscious experience? Yeah. And still beneficial. Like, you know, what's the intention? Does it have to be an intention there? Yeah. Or not? So some of these experiments have been done where they've actually taken um they've effectively um taken people, they're in a lab, then they stress them. So they've all got the same amount of stress. So they make them do a backward digit test or they do um uh, electric shocks. Well, sound very nice, but they do them. <laughs> And then they measure their recovery rate and they look at these different to show that it, it effectively it is it's not a, it's not about actually being there walking and, and it's actually a, it is a, an auto a, a, a auto automatic response that occurs. And with the smell, there's a really nice study because some people say, well, smell is related to cultural things. So therefore, it's very hard to separate. You, you smell that thing. It'll remind you of a nice thing that you knew before. So they did the same experiment on eight week old babies to, and found that they had, that they're, it, obviously they weren't measuring quite as many things, they but they, 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 were certainly, <laughs> they were not doing anything like that. But what they found was they got very strong results from eight week old babies who have obviously no cultural background to that smell. So it does seem to be something that is independent of, of uh, as much as you can tell of, of our own cultural. Cultural backgrounds in there. And so you don't think there needs to be like a, a skill home about, about paying attention to the surroundings. It, it can be a sort of. It, it, no, most there, many of these are just you know they, they are yeah uh, we don't need to have we don't I mean I think maybe no we don't need to do that at all. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, that's really fascinating. I just wanted to come back to this issue about uh, urban design. Mm -hmm. and, um, mm. It's more of a, a reflection, really, and uh, I I could see that once we begin to know more about the functionality mm. of individual species mm. and then uh, we will tend to codify them mm. and select for particular characteristics mm. and one, one can see that um, urban nature becomes more designed mm. uh, for particular purposes and maybe less diverse I could really see see that sort of mm. thing happening um, I, I guess, though, um, you know, we know far too little about it at the moment to start going down that route, mm. but uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, possibility, mm. I think. I think that's true of all of all of the, um, so, I mean, where I started was natural capital. So we're, you know, we're already planting trees because in, and doing bad things by planting monodominant forests because of their ability to soak up carbon. So it's all, but within, within a natural capital framework, you're trying to get multiple benefits from a single so that when you in a natural capital framing you would be looking at carbon but biodiversity and also the fact that it's good for soil erosion protection and also water um, flood risk reduction and i think then the the health biodiversity uh, uh, nature for health needs to be thought of in that framing 
because I do agree with you. I mean, maybe I'm not answering the question properly earlier. You know, just to have great straight rows of one sort of tree because you think it's going to give you maximum benefit. It's not going to help anything else at all. But so I, I tend to think of stuff in a natural capital frame, which is very much about how you get maximum benefits for nature and for the, the, the benefits that it then provides to us as, as society. Okay. Um, this is a very important point. I don't know what this part is like the same community that you get to the first Yeah. Oh, interesting. I'm just wondering, you grow up in the desert garden. What did you look after? What did you grow up in the desert Should you park in the desert garden? Yeah. Should you park in the forest? So there was a, there's been a really interesting uh, set of studies done on that, where they took people that like people of different ages, so teenagers and twenty year old men and thirty year old who would spend their whole life in tropical West Africa, and they showed them these different landscapes and asked them to pick the ones that they most liked, and they still picked the savanna landscapes even though they had no background to it. it, was, it it's Relates, yeah, you know, yeah, cool. yeah, really, really. I mean, I found that extraordinary. And that's what I said at the end about the cultural differences. There are there are definitely going to be some in there, but I think that there's more innate, deeper um, uh, preference for these, these savannah landscapes. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, just, you started to answer this, but I just want to push back or repeat mm -hmm. on the, the palette of different bits yeah. of nature. And so we brought in water. Yeah. Uh, I'm immediately thinking about, you know, the birds in the trees. Yeah. Uh, how, how, where do you think the research might laboratories might be in working out? Is it the balance of the palette or the mixture of the palette or whatever that might be? But where do we actually need to go if we're having to make some choices about some of the research laboratories that keep to build up the palette? Well, I think we think about the palette and, and the biodiversity palette, but a lot of these are related to the different, the impact on different senses, sense of smell, touch, sight, and sound. I haven't had time to talk about the sound of touch. Um, so I think it's 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 looking at that framing alongside the palette of species that you have against that, that is, is where we need to be. So sound is a really important one. And so again, it comes back to, yes, you want those birds in the trees, because actually bird sound associated with the biodiverse habitat tree habitat is um is very very important for pain relief but do you feel there's a balance in the research across that spectrum um, yeah, yeah i think so i mean i think there's uh, th there's probably equal numbers in in, in this but I, I, it comes back to like anything you know people are using model organisms they have to right now in order to keep to so this is done in clinical settings with mod, model you know one sort of smell another sort of smell um, otherwise, you can't split apart those different those different uh, responses. But at some point, you need to join them back together again. I don't know if this is slightly beyond your specific area, but do you have the urban planning and implementation of things like this that account for inability and access to nature, especially in urban areas? Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, I don't know if Joseph's here because um, it's Joseph Kidman. So someone in the a lab did an embryol in the lab and he looked at um, he looked at Birmingham street data, uh, tree data, because every tree in Birmingham is um, a map. And and looked at the relationship between the density of trees in Birmingham and um bio record or biobank records and found there was a very strong cultural signal in there which is sort of linked through to the point you're making. And it needs a lot more work. But it's a very good point. I think I've always was telling you about the, the Ash Dieback study. Yes. What is that there? You're totally controlling for social spatial yeah. factors. Yes. The same streets yes. over time as yes. trees disappear and people's health deteriorate, but the economic factors are from that. Uh, yeah. Is this? Uh, thank you, Kathy. Very nice talk. I'm, I'm quite quite different to what we are used to, I guess, mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. here. Uh, I, I, you have been talking about the, for instance, about the reflectance that you get with uh, and this NDI. Yeah. And the impact that they have. And the, in the analysis that you show, I think most of them you just take one, one color, right? Kind yeah. Of, that's the color. To what extent do you think it's more, more than that? 
that single color is this uh, heterogeneity that you have yeah. the same that actually brings this reaction. That work yeah. just has not been done. I mean, it needs to be done. You're absolutely right. The NDVI work has, it's very much just looking incremental in click. And, you know, what on earth does that mean? When you, as you know better than I do, it's like, um, and, but that that's why I think those big biobank data studies and the big GIS studies are good, but all they're showing is an association. It's then the, it's the, it's the clinical studies that sit underneath that, that are trying to tease apart what those relationships are. But I mean, I think there's a lot more work that should be done and needs to be done on understanding the complexity of that NDVI signal. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I'm just coming from back to on my experience working with urban planners, developers, mm -hmm. consultants, housing development companies, and thinking about still we get housing offices mm -hmm. with a lot of asterisk earth and plastic yep. plants still. I think at the moment it's something like a four billion industry mm -hmm. company. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading online the other day, it was like one of the unexpected benefits of asteroid have is they've got proven psychological benefits for your well-being. What's your perspective <laughs> on the ground very tangible? Do you think such as there now to make very direct recommendations yeah. for urban planning and development yeah. on a kind of global scale? Or I'm just thinking London, you know, there are obviously being built with astroturf sections for their staff to spend well yes. being. So my partner works in yeah. the yeah. London. And they just their new building has a whole indoor kind of forest area yeah. full of plastic plants with astroturf yeah. extensions. <laughs> That's no, I know, but so and that's what that work has not been done to actually say, okay, let's compare the plastic equivalent of the astroturf versus actually having because there's a, a that plastic example of, is a great one because it shows that you don't get the same benefits and because it's not just one thing, it's not just the color, it's probably the smell, yeah. and so astroturf is whatever it's that's certainly not going to provide that. But also, it's, it's it's the diversity in there as well. AstroTurf is very uniform. So it's all of those things. And so a plastic equipment doesn't work. Yeah. Probably the best way to deliver these messages yeah. is through sort of, you know, something that would make sense to a developer. Yes. Particularly economic benefits, they actually could be a private benefit living in this housing state or living in yeah. this from having real nature. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Economic benefits <laughs> Uh, I'll take another one from online. It's from David Nogue Bravo. Uh, how do we increase the awareness among policymakers around the medicinal solutions of nature? Um, how do we increase the polymetal policymakers? I think it's we need to move um we we absolutely need to move nature into the um broader natural capital framing. Right now, the benefits of um nature for health are not there. I mean, I've added them in there, but they are not there. All that we have is um, in there is land for recreation, but nothing to do with nature for recreation in there. I think that's the policy way in. But I also think in the UK anywhere, anyway, right now, our, the people who are responsible for our nature, as you know, are DEFRA, but that's nature associated with farming and possibly forestry. Nature ought to also be with buys and linked through to our, our transport networks. And it should also be linked through to the Department of Health or whatever they're called now. So, and then the last one, nature should actually also be linked into education because the some of the best work that I could talk for hours, so I'll shut up in a minute, that's been done is in Spain where they looked at a number of infant schools and they looked at how much green the children could see out their window and their cognitive ability, their cognitive uh, performance over two years. And they showed very clearly, it didn't matter what the economic background of the children, those that could see out of their windows more green over those two years got better and better test scores. Mm -hmm. So again, I think we need to be bringing it into all aspects of, of our of our way of planning and policy. How can we done? Well, the way to, to, way to do it is to get it back into, I mean, I think as scientists, we ought to be um, demonstrating case studies where you're actually able to show the clinical and the mechanisms in there because that's one of the problems right now nature is often part often is just seen as a, a, a sort of you know butterflies nice nice pretty flowers and it, we're not in that space um and if you look at the environment 
I mean, I think about the UK where you fitted in, but it is each and every time we need to be thinking about what policies are out there and how do you fit well-being and nature in there. Okay. Um, I just want to jump back to what Nikki was yeah. saying about the very arid environments. Yeah. Um, because I know, yeah, it's been discussed that having the um, artificial alternative yeah. is you know, it's like, um, like absurd here. Yeah. Yeah. But in those kinds of settings where you're in a really arid environment, how do you, you create some sort of um, replica? Of mm. You could create here yeah, very easily with vegetation, but I'm thinking where I've done field work in southern Namibia, mm. there's just such a lack of trees. Yeah. And some of the farmers have actually painted their house to green mm. um, in some sort of effort to see green. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because they said that that you know, that's increases their mental health. That's interesting. That's very interesting. I don't know the answer to that, actually, other than. Um, I, I, yeah, house plants. I, I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, I remember going to Ethiopia to go to Addis Ababa, and that that city, I, it has no vegetation at all. It's just all dry. And I think you know, it's how do you find those species that will grow in those sorts of environments that will provide at least something, if not the colour, the shape. Mm -hmm. So you start to have that that landscape. To start to see those things on the on those landscapes. I think so many mega cities. Yeah. Like yeah, that was just, yeah. yeah, you can see why we've got to press them then. I think a couple more questions. Oh, do you think that building of bigger green spaces, like increasing plant cover in cities, can like stop urban heat islands from forming, little hot spots, and every sense of the word? Possibly. I don't know enough about it, but I would, I, I would think so. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, but I would imagine so. I would imagine so. That would be my fair bit of work showing that much yeah. of climate change changed. Yeah. Um, yeah more you have the more about the transpiration you have, more cool yeah. the less concrete absorbing yeah. the radiating heat. Yeah, I think that doesn't matter. Okay, we'll take two more. Um so this kind of thinking about so a couple of previous questions. I was wondering, so um Someone asked about the importance of kind of paying attention, but it has there been any studies done on, um, you know, whether knowing why you're spending time in nature has an impact on the benefits. So, you know, if I were in my office's plastic forest mm. and I knew it was because they wanted me to feel better to work harder, I don't think that would work, not just because of the plastic. Yeah. But yeah, if, if people know, okay, well, that tree's been planted because it's supposed to make me more alert, mm. and that one is supposed mm. to reduce my stress, does it have the same impact independent of that knowledge? I don't think anyone's looked at that. I mean, most of the, most of the studies that have been done where it's been, there's a lovely study published a couple of weeks ago, which is looking at micro breaks. So actually how if people look out onto green roof or they look out onto a concrete roof which comes back to the point of bark you know does that actually affect um your ability to do um uh, your uh, what was it? it was the speed of doing this test and also the accuracy and really strong result that if you had a micro bit 40 seconds looking out on the green roof then you had a much you're much more accurate when you came back to the test and much faster for going looking onto a concrete roof but the people when they're, they're doing that they weren't aware of what the experiment was but I, I I think you're right. It could be that you get added benefit if you actually are, are start to think about actually that you know this is doing good. But I don't think it looks at all of these responses that they're measuring are in the they're in the nervous system and the endocrinal systems, which are um independent of, of that sort of that, that thought process. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I guess the studies that you presented to me can indicate that different parts of nature might have, you know, different health benefits, yeah. and it's not necessary that we can pick up just one. Um, I that you didn't mention anything about soil, and maybe that was that you wanted to focus on sort of what we can see. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's been quite a lot of work done. Just kind of exposure to soil. So the microbiome. Yeah. 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 Uh, and some of them are the strongest, actually. Um, I mean, they are. They are a health benefit. Like, you use this to avoid, is 
Sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I'm looking at plants, and yeah. but I mean, there is a whole, whole area of work on the yeah. microbiome, and um, I think it's a really exciting area that's growing right now. Um, but I mean, that's a, that's a, that's that is very, very, very different, and it's it's just a different research area. So yeah, I haven't. I mean, I'm not not looking at that, but I I I, I think. The point being that actually if you're going to take a healthy walk, we already know you need to walk for about 20 minutes. You probably need to walk in the park rather than on the street. You have some nice scented trees and you hear birdsong. <clears throat> those, are, those are sort of, you know, so we, we do already know those things that will be provide a healthier walk than walking in the city with no sound and no trees. Um, with the microbiome stuff, it's probably yeah, the same that when you're looking. And the microbiome in buildings is also really interesting. But the opposite effect. As mentioned, Polly's in charge of putting green plants into our office. It's really interesting. You be focused on shape, colour, and mm. smell and mm. odour. Yeah. And I just wondered, and I asked it with a non yeah. yeah. if there are other things that trees and plants are releasing that we can't see or smell that may be having. Effects on our health. Um, I'm often told to walk through the forest just to, you know, make myself feel better. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that does slightly come back to the previous um, point yeah. about the microbiome and the influence of what's coming through from the soils. Yeah. Um, but maybe more. Yeah. More. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Uh, and so, uh, uh, thank you, Kathy, for a fantastic uh, range of the. Uh, uh, Topics that you've really covered there. And as uh, Kathy mentioned, this is a, a lot of what's going on here is a core part of what we're doing with the center. So we're going to have a number of researchers, starting first with fragrance and smell, and then moving on to site, and then we're looking at other, as I mentioned, over the next coming years. That was a really exciting area of research uh, that, that we're developing. Uh, we have drinks in the atmosphere room, I think, uh, probably, it's just down the corridor. So if you want to carry on the conversation informally and have, have a glass of wine, you're welcome to, to, to join us. And stop throwing the random calls. Uh, okay. <laughs> thank you to everyone who's joined online as well. And thank you for your contributions. <laughs>